Well, welcome. Welcome to this, the last of the 2022 Annual Moore College Lectures. Uh, special welcome to you who are here and those who are guests with us this morning, and an even more special welcome to those of us who are on stream, live stream. It's been a delight during this week to have Dr Kelly Capick with us speaking on the theology of the Christian life. As Kelly told us yesterday, these lectures have really been an extended meditation on the Pauline benediction, and they've been shaped by a rich Trinitarian frame, the love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit shown to us in creation, in the incarnation, in the cross and the resurrection. Kelly has pressed us, uh, pressed upon us the importance of realising that Christian living is not simply an act of memory, but more essentially trust. It's about the present and not just about the past. It is by the wonderful work of the Spirit of God receiving and responding, not just recall. That wonderful confidence, as Kelly put it, that God will not let us go. Now, I'm sure you're looking forward to the, the climax of this series of lectures this morning, and, uh, but let me remind you of a few household details before we begin. Uh, we're using the Slido app for questions again this morning, and you'll see the code for uh, this lecture up on the screen. It's essentially AMCL and today's date, but in the Australian order rather than the American. <laughs> And uh, you can use Slido to ask a question or uh, indicate which questions uh, others have asked that you'd most like to see answered. Throughout the week, we've had many more questions than we've been able to handle in the time available, so I'll seek to field them in order to make the most of the time that we have. You may also like to know that the uh, live stream link for each of the lectures will be active for a week, so you can watch any of the lectures again or catch up with one you've missed. And in a few weeks' time, we expect that the lecture recordings will be available online on the Moore College website. This morning, as uh, each morning this week, Kelly has given us a number of short biblical texts to read to orient us to today's subject. Um, so let me read these. Uh, you don't need to follow them if you uh, don't want to. Psalm 69, verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. And Hebrews 8, verse 6. But as it is... Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. And Acts chapter 2. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved." And Acts 20, and verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. That's just a little bit concerning, isn't it? But <laughs> let's pray together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity that we have to quieten our hearts, to be here in this place and consider what you have to say about what it means to live as your people, to know and to rejoice in the good things that you have done and the good world in which you've placed us 
and the goodness of living as disciples of Christ in the power of the resurrection filled with his spirit. And we pray, Father, this morning, you might quiet in our minds. We pray that you might take distractions from us. We pray that you might strengthen uh, our brother as he brings this lecture to us. And we pray that in all that is said and all that is heard and understood and believed, you might be honoured. And this we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Will you join me with welcoming Dr. Kelly Capick to give his final lecture? It is good to be with you. Uh, this sounds bad one last time, you know, uh, but I'm very thankful. This has been a really wonderful and rich week, week and a half for me um, with Mark and Peter and Chase and just as a faculty as a whole has been incredibly um, gracious and stimulating for my thought and uh, encouraging for my heart. And those of you students that I've gotten a chance to know, you're not bad as well. Uh, no, but really, um, this, is, this has been a great encouragement to me. Um, so <clears throat> let me pray and we'll jump into this last lecture. Our God, you are good and merciful, and holy. You are pure and wise, abounding in compassion. We pray that as your people, you might continue to grow us by your spirit with fruit that others might eat of it and be nourished by you through us. Us both individually and collectively. Give us faithful creativity to handle your word well, to apply it with care. We cannot do it but by your grace and provision. And so we ask this in the name of the risen King. Amen. I want to read you a quote to start with. This comes from Maximus the Confessor. He said this, Practice is the reality of the theory. Practice is the reality of the theory. And then he said, And the theory is the intimate and mysterious nature of the practice. What I want to do today is we're going to turn a corner. We've been really having this extended reflection on who God is as the fundamental foundation of the Christian life. And um, maybe you do or you don't know this. When Mark invites someone to give these lectures, the normal understanding is that they, these will normally eventually become a book. And so this book I'm working on is The Theology of the Christian Life. And what you've heard are bits from about probably the first two-thirds of the book um, which is mostly written, but the last third or so is still to go. And this is me giving you a taste of some of what I'm thinking, but more like pointing in a direction rather than solving things. And so I, I wanted you to know that up front because I would like you to be thinking, and, and I really do welcome questions and suggestions, and I'm looking forward to having lunch with faculty later so I can um, pick their brains. I'm not sure where we got that expression, pick their brains. But, uh, you know, I, I, so I do want to think through this a little bit. Um, but I want to talk today about the liturgy, liturgy in the Christian life. Liturgy in the Christian life, relating faith and practice. Now, the word liturgy may be scary, may mean a lot of different things to you. And you'll see, I, I mean this in a very pretty generic or general way, and I realize I want to give you one other biographical note before I get started here. So you know a little bit of my story. I, I may have alluded to this already, but so I grew up, the youngest of three boys, in, um, in a household where we were active in the Roman Catholic Church. But by the time I was in elementary school, everyone but my father had stopped going. But I, So I did grow up um, in, in a Roman Catholic home, but then Basically, I had nothing to do with Christianity or the faith, but in my high school year, my freshman year in high school, I guess grade nine, um, I was converted, uh, came to this living faith through the ministry of a Baptist church. 
right? I'm a Presbyterian now, but the good thing about Baptists, they actually believe in evangelism, right? <laughs> so, so I was converted in this uh, Baptist uh, youth group. Those of you who are interested in youth ministry, I, de- I think it's of huge significance. And so don't, don't think that that's a lesser ministry. Uh, it, it is what God used to save me. So I was in a Baptist church, but then eventually I got interested, started, I was introduced to some Reformed theology and started reading, and eventually I ended up in a Presbyterian uh, church, and that's where I've been now for decades. But that, and, and when we lived in England for three years, we were part of uh, Orthodox, um, an Orthodox expression of the Church of England while we were there. So that's just to say there's some eclectic stuff there that is both a strength and a weakness, and I'm aware of that. Um, having said that, often the way we think of spirituality, if you're like me, if you're an evangelical, we tend to think of spirituality in purely individualistic terms. And so if you want to encourage someone in their growth in spirituality in evangelical circles, we tend to say, Are you having a quiet time? Are you personally praying? I'm all for that. I think that's vital. It's part of what drew me to the Puritans. My PhD is on a guy named John Owen. This is part of the goodness of our Protestant heritage where it emphasizes that we personally can be in communion with God. But I do think, as a Protestant with some of my own experiences, I personally... I don't know about you, at times have really struggled to value the church. And so that's where we're going to turn. So I wanted you to know a little biography. So this is not, you're not getting something from someone. Maybe I just want, this is really what I want to say. You're not getting a lecture from someone who's totally always been into high liturgy. I is, I'm into smells and bells and I just want, that's not what this lecture is about. Even though I'm talking about liturgy, you'll see. So with that said, I want to begin with this. I think we are tempted, in our theology of the Christian life, I think we are tempted to downplay ecclesiology. And I am feeling this in intense ways in America right now. I mean, who wants to say anything positive about the church these days? How many of you listen to the Mars Hill podcast? That make it here? Okay, so you'll know kind of stuff I'm talking about. Sometimes, even at our best, we're unimpressive. But at our worst, we are outright Sinful, hypocrisy, anger, arrogance, all too often these images surface. It's painful to admit how far we fall short, both collectively and individually. Some of you may know the name Dorothy Day. She was the co-founder of the Catholic Worker, but she said this long ago, and Augustine said something similar, but I like how she says it. She says, as to the church, and she's aware of just how far it falls short, she says, as to the church, Where else shall we go except to the bride of Christ? Though she is a harlot at times, she is our mother. We should read the book of Hosea, she says, which is the picture of God's steadfast love. And part of what I like about what Dorothy Day is doing there is she acknowledges the sin so often practiced by God's people, and and yet she reminds us It is, and this is key, God's people, his bride, his body. The church's centrality, and this is so important, is first and foremost a theological observation and not a sociological one. The church's importance is a theological observation, not so much a sociological one. What that means is... When you value the church, it doesn't never downplay the abuse of Christian leaders or hurtful practices in the church. A high view of the church is not an excuse to ignore those things. But we must remember that the holiness and the indispensability of the church is not contingent upon the moral purity of the people leading or attending those religious services. The church's holiness is dependent upon God himself. I just doesn't, boy, I'm on page one. We'll see how this goes. But I, I was asked yesterday, someone asked a good question afterwards. We were talking, and some version of, you know, um, God is holy, and he can't be in the presence of sin. And, and it, 
we were talking a little bit about that, and I'm reminded about this. Some, so I do know where we get that biblically, this idea God is holy, can't be in the presence of sin, but it would just be just as an aside, maybe to start a war or whatever, but just so you know, if you take that phrase and idea, that cliche, without thinking through it, you have a huge problem. Because if Jesus is truly God, he is in the presence of sinners. And also, where is the Holy Spirit? He comes and dwells in us. We are holy, not because we personally are without sin. And the surprise is that the holy God who can't be in the presence of sin, that doesn't drive him away. It drives him to his people in order that he might purify and make whole. So here, here's what I want you to remember in this respect. In the creed, in the third stanza, has it ever come to your attention that we actually confess this? I believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church. Do you ever notice the believe? It actually takes belief. Because when you empirically look at the church, we're not very much one. We're often not very holy, right? We're not Catholic. We're not, we're not always faithful to the apostolic teaching. It takes belief. Confessing the church's holiness is an act of faith. It's not empirical science. John Calvin said it this way. The word believe here, I love this. The word believe is used because often no other distinction can be made between God's children and the ungodly, between his own flock and, this is Calvin's language, wild beasts. Calvin says you just got to believe it because they don't often look different. Rarely have people had a difficult case proving that Christians are also serious sinners. But as you know, you can't actually be a Christian without confessing that you're a sinner. Despite the shortcomings, the church is central to God's presence and work in the world. Cyprian of Carthage, 210 to 258 in the early church, said this startling phrase, maybe you've heard it before. He said, can you imagine, outside the church there is no salvation. Outside the church, there is no salvation, extra ecclesium nola solis. Now, that is a potentially very controversial statement. But it was never actually meant merely for later Roman Catholics. It may surprise you that Protestant voices, including someone like Martin Luther, even Puritans like John Owen, would, in their own particular way, with certain qualifications, use that expression. The point was to highlight how God particularly works in and through his church. He uses his church to call, to shape, to heal, to preserve people. John Calvin memorably used a version of Cyprian's claim when he concluded that, quote, to those to whom God is a father, the church may also be a mother. In a different tradition, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, a less uh, Alexei uh, Komenikov put it this way. And again, it's a different tradition. This may feel funny to you, but sometimes I want us to hear other voices so we can be pushed in certain ways. Listen to what he says. No one is saved alone. He who is saved, he's using masculine pronouns, I'll just leave it. He who is saved is saved in the church as a member of her and in union with all of her other members. If anyone believes, he or she is in communion of faith. If he loves, he is in communion of love. If he prays, he is in communion of prayer. The point there that you could modify and incorporate in a Protestant perspective is that our faith is meant to be lived within a worshiping community. Whatever the potential strengths and weaknesses of Cyprian's slogan, I think it can nudge us in some helpful ways to think about the importance of the church. Because participating in, remember, God's church, both spread out organically across the world and scattered throughout history, but also locally gathered in particular locations. Right? We don't want just a romanticized view of the church. Right? It's kind of like Bonhoeffer in his life together. He says, there's no more enemy of community than people who like to talk about community. Right? People who love the church often are not actually in the church. 
because the church is messy and it's hard. But no, 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 no. This is, this is part of being in the local community. Part of the Catholic nature of faith is entering into this, joining this corporate people as an invitation to rest under the great cloud of witnesses, a vast people of faith who have historically, culturally, and currently are diversified and yet united in our worship of the triune Lord. Differences cannot always be ignored or downplayed, but neither should the secondary distinctions become primary. The church is the gathered people of God and can never, despite the rise in the last you know, 50 to 100 years, the rise of kind of personalist, privatized religion, as Christians, we can never ignore or belittle the church. And throughout history, with a special intensity in our own day, it can be very hard to speak of the church's importance. So here's the next question. Is the institutional church really necessary to a theology of Christian life? Like, do we need the church? Maybe you just need quiet times and you just need to read devotional books, but you don't need to go to church. You don't need to be a part of the church. So does the church's institution matter? As you know, one of the challenges that makes valuing the church so difficult in our day is that institutions in general are no longer, by and large, well, at least in America. I'd be curious how it is here. But by and large, institutions are not viewed very positively right now. Do you have this expression, the man? Is that, is that here too, right? So the man, right, that corporate head, that, that institution has mistreated people. Hierarchy has perpetuated oppression. Power structures have ignored injustice. Institutions in all spheres of life are now viewed with lingering suspicion. I mean, this covers everything. Government, marriage, media, religious organizations, trade unions, and so many others. There is no institution I can think of, and maybe I'm wrong, that seems to escape the skeptical, knowing gaze. For example, workers have learned not to trust employers who require loyalty of the workforce, because too often those laborers discover that once things get difficult for the company, those same authorities rarely feel compulsion to show fidelity to the employees. It's a... It's a one-way relationship. Hidden, and we see this in institutions, hidden motives, self-serving agendas, unethical practices, all too commonly drive once cherished institutions into places we now are very nervous about. Trust erodes, misgivings increase, and relationships either dissolve or never form in the first place. We need to keep that larger cultural challenge in mind when we're talking to people about Christianity and inviting them into church. Confidence in an institution is rare because so many organizations have fallen apart. I mean, there are serious political writers who are wondering, and I'm sure you know some of this, like, it sounds crazy, but is America going to make it? Because right now, nobody trusts any institution. Since I've been here, as you know, the FBI is invading and people, it's not just funny, like, ah, no one trusts institutions. Like, people are talking about weapons and stuff. But there's something when that kind of suspicion seeps into the church. Let me tell you this, how, I, I bet you've heard this phrase before. No, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Christianity is not a religion or relationship. No, that deeply resonates with a lot of us, and there is some, there's an element of truth that that contains. But actually, what kind of relationship are we talking about? Is that relationship just a privatized you and God? Because biblically, relating to God consistently is also about relating to his people. Is the church optional? Do corporate gatherings for worship really matter? Biblically, as I said, life with God is consistently framed in communal terms. And a holy life is meant to grow among a people of faith who worship together and serve the living Lord. Love of God, love of neighbor, they're meant to be cultivated together as they, people of God, extend God's love to the world. 
And so we have these regular gatherings of Christians. And let me be clear, when I'm talking about church, it, I don't mean you have to have a cathedral. It could be in a field. Right? There, are, there are believers who gather together all around the world, sometimes private, sometimes huge gatherings, sometimes very small. But, but this regular gathering together, corporate worship, I think is central to the formation, to spiritual formation. And what matters, I want to make sure you get this, is not so much the size or the number, but there is this corporate nature to the context of worship. So we can have a legitimate debate about church polity, whether you hold to an Episcopal form of church government or a Presbyterian or a congregational. What the institution of the church might look like, we can debate. But my hope is that we should all agree at least to a regular gathering of God's people for corporate worship. And this, I believe, ends up being vital to our vision of the Christian life. These gatherings represent in some meaningful way the institution of the church. But by institution, what I'm really trying to get at is that, that this is bigger than any single individual. The form of the institutional nature of the church can be debated, but the institution must be larger than the individual. That's central to the basic point here. The primacy is on the community over autonomous individuals, honoring our shared adoption of God as our Father, the concrete nature of being part of the body of Christ, and the unifying nature of the Spirit. The church, whatever ecclesial expression she comes in, is an institution because it points to a faith, and this is very important, it points to a faith received rather than created. It participates in an epic history. I know congregation, you know, a neighborhood church, you know, I'll be at a neighborhood church and I'll visit. They are not part of any denomination. They don't claim, they don't say just us in the Bible. But when you listen, they may never even read the, the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, but it is shaping how they talk and what they say, whether or not they've realized it. There is something this is received. The church is this institution. It points towards a future that is collective and not merely individual. And when a healthy, when healthy, the institutional church honors particular people without allowing any individual to become the basis or center. Because who's the only center of our churches? Jesus, the Messiah. But when you end up with the institution of the church is unhealthy all kinds of destructive forces try to manipulate the church. We've seen a huge rise in narcissistic pastors whose charismatic leadership has been used to build a personal empire. Or you find a congregation that's unconsciously allowing distorting forms of Christian nationalism to replace the biblical call to love and serve your neighbor or even your enemy. We could go on. These distortions are not, and this is what's key, because we can't deny they happen. They are not evidence for why we should give up on the institutional nature of the church. Instead, they're signs of why neglecting its importance leaves us, in vul leaves us vulnerable to abuse and to be misshapen in our Christian life. This is partly why many are giving up on the church. I see this. I work with college students on a regular basis. And as they experience the hypocrisy and shortcomings in the church, they are tempted to not just give up on the church, not just tempted to give up on, say, the Republican Party. They're tempted to give up on the faith. This really matters. Sadly, before too long, this resignation results in giving up of the faith once handed down. But a proper theology of the Christian life will not abandon the church. Right? Abandoning the church may sound like a path to freedom, but actually, abandoning the church is the path to isolation, instability, and vulnerability. I want to give you 
a lesson, and some of you may know this, but lessons from the ancient church. I want to talk about the Donatist controversy and today. Some of you may remember a little bit about that. Um, we're not alone. It's not like a new thing when people have debated about the importance of the church. Beginning in 303 AD, you had the Diocletian persecution against Christians which swept throughout the Roman Empire, including many areas in North Africa under a Roman governor. And you may know this, but during that time, you had ministry leaders, some ministry leaders, who were exposed as hypocrites and worse. And it was because they denied the faith by symbolically handing over the scriptures, the sacred scriptures, to these authorities. They were called traditores, traitors. They handed over the holy words of God rather than keeping and honoring the faith. A massive failure in character. But as you may or may not know, the question later, after the persecutions ended, and as the church is trying to figure out what, how do we do the church, what do you do with these priests who had married all kinds of people, who had baptized all kinds of people, but then later had been traditories, had been traitors? Does that mean you're not baptized? Does that nullify your marriage? Right? And as you probably know, the short answer is no. But why? Because God is faithful and the institution of the church matters. The institution is bigger than an individual and God's promises were greater than a particular minister's shortcomings and sins. Some of you have probably had that. You were maybe brought to faith by someone in your youth ministry who later, scandalous things came out about them. And this has created great crisis in your faith. This ancient debate has great relevance for you and me. God promises the gates of hell will not prevail. And though human sinfulness and failings often make it seem like that might happen, Christians can trust in the words of God's kindness and his benediction even if you later learn that those who spoke those words to you were hypocrites, because their lies don't undo God's truths. Someone telling you that God loves you and then turns out to be a very unloving person does not make the fact that God loves you untrue. So first, this is about God's word, his presence, and his promises. And secondly, it is about ministers and individuals in the congregation. But the theological truths are tied to this idea of the institution. Now, it is true, again, I'm a reformed theologian, the church as institution does occasionally need renewal and reformation. A hundred percent, I agree with that. But what is never needed what is never needed is the destruction of the church. That's never needed. Christianity was never meant to be a religion of autonomous, isolated individuals. This faith grows out of and fosters corporate worship, a faith linked to and sustained by our union with Christ and our union with other believers. Part of what I hope you've gotten this week is I think it's so wonderful. We need to recapture this idea of union with Christ, but we need to see biblically that union also brings with it a union to other believers. We are part of this family. Now, you do hear sometimes, well, Christians, you know, we talk about this kind of thing, and you're talking about the value of the church. We'll say, well, what about, what about this Christian in Iran? They can't gather with other Christians, and they just listen on the radio privately in their in the room, and they worship with believers or from around the world as they listen to, you know, uh, something from somewhere else. And I want to say, praise God for that. But you ask that person, and I've asked some of them, is that a good thing? And they will tell you what? No. Right? They will rebuke us harshly when they hear us talk about church and like, I can't believe we've got to go to church. And like, they would love for a physical embrace from another Christian. They would love to have another Christian pray with them when they don't feel like they can pray. 
So praise God, he can meet an isolated individual when there's no one else around. He can and he does do that. But don't make the fact that he can and does do that mean that that's an ideal. Don't romanticize that. That's just part of God's grace. We should lament for them and long that they can gather together with God's people. We were never meant to be alone, and the epicenter for Christian communion is meant to be the church, not just mystically in a universal kind of way, but physically in local gathered expressions. Now, if we had more time, I'd talk about how practices alone are insufficient because there is uh, people like Stanley Hauerwas and others, and part of where I'm going to argue is just how important these liturgical practices or, or these patterns in our lives really are. But Lauren Winner, for example, has a recent book called The Dangers of Christian Practice, where she shows in the history of the church you can have people doing, really practicing something like prayer and being horrendous. So I don't want to oversell these things, but neither should we undersell them. So having said that, aware of some of the dangers, I do want to argue that church practices are part of theology and formation. Psychologists and sociologists often make theologians nervous. I've spent a lot of the last five, ten years uh, working with this group called the Templeton Foundation, and I work with Christian psychologists and um, studying all kinds of things. And as a theologian, I'm like, ah, I don't know, you know, this kind of thing. But here's what's great about them. Here's where they push. Because I'm a theologian, I'll say, well, this is what we believe. They're like, really? Because kind of the slogan is often, don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you believe. And that's really hard as pastors and theologians. I'm like, no, 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 who cares about that? It's easy for people to make claims to not at cognitive assertions, but in actual life, belief is far more complicated than that. If you want to know what a person really believes or trusts, observe their life, their actions, their instincts, their intuitions, or to just save time, look at how they spend their money. Here one is reminded of James' admonition that faith apart from works is dead, Heartless attitudes, apathetic engagement exposes that there really isn't this kind of faith or religion that James is calling people to in the first place. They may have claimed truth and belief, but neglecting the orphan and the widow, being arrogant toward the materially poor and needy, being consumed by selfish desires, these are all, according to James, a sign of a lack of faith. And he says, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers. Don't be like someone who looks at themselves in the mirror and walks away and forget what you look like. You see, Christians are meant to be formed and shaped. But the point for us is not impeccability. Don't, when you hear that, some of you just went, oh my gosh, I'm studying all the time. When am I going to go visit orphans? Well, it's a longer talk to think through that. But, it, it, well, no, nah, this is for free now. Because if I don't get to everything, I, I do want you to know this. You need to know this as potential ministry. Read James. Read Jesus in Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. Sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. It's a pretty sober passage, right? But when you read the passage, what separates the sheep and the goats? Sorry, this is my teacher. I'm just waiting for you. But, you know, do you clothe? Do you feed? Do you visit the prisoners? If you read that red, red lettered part of your Bible and don't just draw on a bunch of other passages to solve it, don't just wait for Tim Keller to solve it for you, just actually soak in that passage. Are any of us sheep? So, here I want to tell you something that I think is important for you to know as ministers it takes the entire church to be the one body of Christ. It takes the entire church to be one body of Christ. Do you know that this week I have ministered to orphans in Nepal? And I have evangelized in Japan. And I have prayed with children in the hospital. You're like, really? Really? 
Yeah, because I am united to Christ and to his people. And it takes the whole church to be faithful to Matthew 25. And if you, as an individual, think that you must do everything in Matthew 25 all on your own all the time, you will be crushed because you and I are not Messiah. But when we learn to value the entire body of Christ, then when you, when you see someone visiting the orphan and visiting the prisoner, rather than feeling guilty, you are to celebrate and honor and contribute to that in prayers encouragement in other ways. Anyways, that's a longer conversation. But the point is, repentance is not a negative thing when we see our falling short. Repentance is, is unto life. Repentance is a very sign of one's head and heart being active, connecting faith and action. Confession or repentance are great liberating signs of genuine faith. The, the fact that you, need to, you and I need to repent doesn't mean, oh, we're not Christians. It's a great sign that we are. But anyways, I would like to, we've got to think in more communal ways. Corporate worship is meant to play a particularly powerful role in shaping Christians. And formation happens through various practices associated with worship, though we often don't realize it. Those practices will either help or hinder Christian life. The church participates in a liturgy a liturgy that alone cannot guarantee faith or faithfulness. And yet corporate worship is a liturgy meant to shape us to be a particular kind of people who worship the risen king, who in fellowship with the spirit participate in the very love of God. Now again, by liturgy and practices, I don't actually have a what you might call a high liturgy in mind. Some of you may go to think of what are often called low liturgical or non-liturgical churches, right? Like, I don't really believe in liturgy. I go to a contemporary church. We kind of have a contemporary rock band in front or whatever it is. But those of you who are clever, I'm not going to assume it's all of you. <laughs> Even in those settings, after a while, did you ever notice, like, you can predict what the song is going to be like? You, can, you know when the prayer is, everyone's like, no, 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 for it to be authentic worship, it's, it needs to be spontaneous. It's just funny how spontaneous starts to look very similar as the days turn into years and decades. I don't think that's a bad thing. All, my only point is to say everybody has liturgies, whether or not we recognize it. There are rituals. There are these kind of things. All right, so next I want to mention Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi. In 435 AD, Prosper of uh, Aquitaine coined this phrase, the law of prayer constitutes the law of belief. The law of prayer constitutes the law of belief. Often reduced to this phrase, lex arandi, the law of prayer, lex credendi, the law of belief. The question is, how should we understand the relationship between the law of prayer and the law of belief? Is one lex, is one law more vital than the other? I'm going to skip some of that debate. But I do want you to know that the importance of the slogan is less about deciding if handing down practices is most important or the abiding institution or doctrines have the determining voice, uh, force. Instead, I want us to see that whether we admit it or recognize it or not, these two are inseparable. Faith and practice are inseparable. Liturgy, even whether or not it's called liturgy or recognized, plays a central role in shaping and reflecting a theology of Christian life. Let me circle back. To know what people believe, watch how we worship. Listen to how we pray. Now, to cultivate a godly and authentic beliefs, we need to pray, participate in the liturgy. And in praying, belief often emerges and grows. And yet, strangely, those very prayers in the first place are fueled by an underlying knowledge that guides the content of those prayers to what is directed. In other words, through corporate worship, one especially learns to believe and to pray. We're formed in the community of faith in the great cloud of witnesses, and they are mutually reinforcing realities. Liturgical scholar Edmund 
Kilmartin once concluded that the law of prayer on the one hand, this law of prayer, think of it as a practice, this communal practice, he says, implies a comprehensive and in some measure a pre-reflective perception of the life of faith. On the other hand, we are aided by the law of belief because, as he says, we must reckon with the limits of the liturgy as lived practice of faith. You see, worship is relational, but those relationships are not abstract. They take recognition and context. If you've not understood what I've said, here's the tension. Kissing my wife helps grow and reflect our relationship. But don't you think it's important I make sure it's my wife I'm kissing? (laughs) Right? Belief and practice go together. But you'll have some people who will never kiss their spouse and say, I love them. Well, I know culturally, okay, we could use a different expression than kissing. But at some point, when someone says, well, it's, um, uh, do you love me? You know that? You guys don't know that? (laughs) You don't know Fiddler on the Roof? Thank you, Fiddler on the Roof. That's your homework, watch Fiddler on the Roof. Oh my goodness. That's that's more problematic than the Lego thing, but. (laughs) Beliefs shape our prayers, prayers shape our beliefs. Whether you treat the divinity as a heavenly Santa Claus, or you cry out to God as a political revolutionary, or we ignore the transcendent presence by just not praying, all of those experiences or practices grow out of and reinforce or even reshape our beliefs. As some philosophers will talk about, what we're dealing with, it's, it's not linear. It's multiple webs of reciprocity. Sometimes we like things nice and clean, like, no, you've got to learn this, and then you do this. In fact, uh, you ever heard this thing, like, especially for those of you who are studying right now, like, you cannot keep up with all the theology you're learning. And sometimes you might feel or express it somewhere like this. You think, um... My life can't keep up with all this good theology. Like, I can't keep up with how it's so good, and my life can't keep up. And I think that's true, and I think you need to be aware of that. But here's something that can also be true. It's not just that your theology can be better than your life. Do you know your life can be better than your theology? I know people who will say, God is not sovereign. I don't believe in that or anything like that. And then when I pray with them, They beg like no reformed person I know and call out to God for his provision and thank him for his grace and praise him for every good and perfect gift that comes from above. And they live in utter dependence on the sovereignty of God, but philosophically they seem opposed. It's not just your theology is better than your life. Sometimes your life is better than your theology. That's worth being aware of. There is a gift in Christian rituals I'm just going to summarize five points drawn by Bernard Kuhl and Gary Macy in their volume, Oxford Press, on uh, Christian symbol and ritual. I'm going to go fast here, but just to kind of get you thinking, these are on rituals, why they matter for us. I say rituals are mutually informative, growing out of and also shaping our beliefs. They're mutually reinforcing. They grow out of our beliefs, but then they also shape our beliefs. Secondly, they argue through rituals, Christians mature. One of the, one of the conversations, I don't know if it's here as well, um, back in the States in various settings and with various natures is what happens when we lose rites of passage for people? And sometimes you find they never mature. And part of what they're saying is Christian rituals can bring Christian maturity. Third, Christian rituals of worship are shaped and governed by the risen Christ. They must in some way be shaped and governed by the risen Christ. Number four, these rituals help shape worship and are meant to promote service. They shape our worship, but also promote service. And obviously, we'd want to unpack all of these, and I can point you to the volume if you're interested. But finally, they say, rightly oriented Christian rituals foster a deeper identity of family among God's people. What we believe is pretty radical. I mean, it's one thing to join a bowling club, right, or a badminton club, 
or an Australian Rose football club, or you name it, a gardening club. You gather to pe together with people, or as I was running through University of Sydney and they had just had all of these hundreds of clubs, and it was about your ethnic group or your sporting interest. But what's interesting is we come together as the people of God around Christ, and we're supposed to come from every tribe, tongue, and language, male and female, rich and poor, all of that radically coming together. We get reshaped by it. All I want to say there is ritual is not our enemy, nor is it our savior. It is a gift that reflects how God makes us and remakes us. We need rituals, and rituals need truth. Oh, but the point of being together is just the radical nature of being the family of God. Next, Christ in the shape of Christian liturgy. Christ in the shape of Christian liturgy. In 1965, J.J. von Ullmann, this originally was written in French. He was a Reformed theologian, actually. He wrote this volume called Worship, which I think is pretty stunning. But von Ullmann states that the New Testament, you know, some of these claims since we would modify, but he states that the New Testament frames the Christian response to God through the entire life of Jesus. He actually makes this case about the synoptic gospels in general, and other writers, and I would agree with him, be more hesitant about that in terms of this trying to get a strong, unified liturgy, or that, that the gospels are reflecting, kind of, I was alluding to this the other day, an already existent liturgy. But nevertheless, there is this broad, basic pattern that Ullman and others will note, and no, it's very basic, but in the gospels, this is what you get. First, they assert and confirm the coming of Messiah. He's come. Second, there is this focus on the preaching of Christ, his calling, particularly in the Galilean ministry. So it's this preaching of Christ and his calling with people responding in faith and new life. Third, turning more towards Jerusalem, there's this concentration on Jesus' death and, as Ullman says, the eschatological eruption of the resurrection. And then finally, Jesus blesses and sends them to bear witness to the world. However much you want to talk about the, the Gospels actually being constructed like a liturgy or something, I think we really want to be careful with that. But I do think this instinct that the entire life and ministry of Jesus the Messiah is central to Christian existence, and this is what he says, and I think this is right. His whole life serves as a liturgical process and in fact, as he says, the liturgy, the life of worship accepted by God. And then he adds, the Christological basis of the church's worship, talked about Christ-centered nature of our worship, Christological basis of our worship consists in the ministry of Jesus, the act of perfect worship, which he has made of his life. It is of this messianic cult that the church is both the memorial and an effective echo. Now, you could debate legitimately some of the details of von Ullmann's structural reading of the synoptics and other things. But I think he's right to connect Christ, worship, and these earliest churches' instincts of faith, praise, devotion, and that they inevitably do have some liturgical significance. Some of you may know this language from Irenaeus of recapitulation. A recapitulation theory, this reliving. The argument is that the pattern, I think recapitulation, the pattern of recapitulation of the life of Jesus becomes the skeleton for corporate worship. From calling to coming, from preaching to praying, from sacrifice to benediction. We took time the other day to look at Revelation 4 and 5, this Lamb of God who acts in a priestly fashion as the head worshiper who himself is also the object of worship. The Messiah as both the representative and embodiment of God's love, grace, and desire to draw us into renewed fellowship with the Creator. This same Messiah is now the great representative of humanity leading our worship offering himself as a sacrifice, perfectly serving as our priest, prophet, and king. 
The idea is connecting Christology, corporate worship, and the Christian life. Lucetta Mowry has argued that Revelation 4 and 5 might, as she says, have the earliest known form of Christian service of worship. Now, she, again, may be saying too much, but as I said the other day, there is this heavenly scene of worship that in some way does end up corresponding to post-apostolic worship. In this general, there is a call to worship. There's divine revelation that is received. There is praise and song to the Creator and Redeemer. There are prayers offered. There is active congregational response of doxology, all done as worship directed to God alone who is worthy. Now focused on the mediator. And so early worship services, and not just the preaching, had the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection as their focal point bringing a new vision of God and of his world, including a vision of how we as his people are to live in it. Now, let's jump to some basic elements of the corporate worship. If we had time, we'd look at how similar the earliest, the debate is what does the earliest services look like? And I spent a lot of time on this. Um, There's profound connections between kind of synagogue-style gatherings and what we find in the most ancient accounts of corporate Christian gatherings. But more recent scholarship still acknowledges that but warns against an earlier generation that basically says early Christian practices were exactly like the synagogue. No, there's profound continuity and some discontinuity. It's not simply a reduplication of ancient Hebrew worship services, but neither, and this is important if you don't know this, neither do we find in Christianity a new religion, right? This is why you have to learn the Hebrew Bible. When someone says, well, I'm a New Testament Christian, you're like, well, I don't know what that is. You can't know who Jesus is without the Hebrew Bible. So there is this this profound debt to the Hebrew scriptures and of the synagogue things, and yet there's a radical difference because now these services center on Christ. Not, he's not just an add-on. It transform, transforms the entire experience of cor- corporate worship. I'm going to skip me telling you how I think we get there in terms of what are the elements in the worship service. But basically, I think it comes down to the best. And, and I'm interested, my ultimate goal, whenever I actually get to write this, my goal is to try and faithfully see what we find in the scriptures and in the church in a way that I think an Anglican and a Baptist, right, and and a Presbyterian and even a Roman Catholic or something could look at it and go, yeah, I see what's going on there, right? There's something about that. In other words, I'm not trying to smuggle in a particular tradition. I do think every tradition might want to modify, might want to add, might want to minimize, but what, what is core? And you seem to have this pattern of call and response where God calls and believers come. God speaks and believers confess, praise, and pray. God gives life, Lord's Supper. Believers give, especially to their neighbors, in almsgiving and offering. God gives a benediction, and believers go out as a blessing to the world. Now, with that in mind, keep in mind my basic argument, my thesis. Christian life is a response to the love of God. Built on this Trinitarian foundation of emphasizing divine action, it's right to see corporate worship as framing our human response. And because Christ is the center of our shared life, corporate worship plays a necessary and distinctive role for believers. Where calling invites coming and invitation, think baptism, proclamation, and I would for proclamation I would say both read and preached, provokes faith or confession, prayer and praise. Lord's Supper or Eucharist grounds and enables our gratitude, made manifest in the offerings. The peace of Christ enables us to live in peace with our neighbor, and the benediction frees us and sends us out in love to serve a broken and dying world. God reveals himself through this calling, proclamation, Lord's Supper, etc. 
But by our union with Christ, we are also joined with Christ's own human response, where he comes, he has faith, he offers prayers and praises and peacemaking and offering. So in the corporate worship service, I do think, as I mentioned the other day, I actually, the argument where I'm going is that I think at its best, in a very basic way, the corporate worship service reflects the basic arc of the Christian life. From calling and prayer uh, and praise and offerings to benediction. And that arc, I think, is lived in a threefold way where that that arc is lived as the corporate people of God who are called, who, are, who go through all of these parts, who pray, who, who are sent. But there's also a Christological, and there's also a personal. So I want to end our time by just giving you a taste of what that might look like by using the example of calling. Calling. How does this work Christologically, corporately, and personally in our worship? Worship services emerge with God's calling. Now, many traditions, and um, the Anglican tradition is quite diverse, um, and yet you're more often attuned to this than others. These worship services, corporate worship services, often actually begin with an actual verbal or visual clue where you begin corporate worship by inviting people to God, sometimes with a passage like, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. But even churches that don't have a formal call to worship, there's still inevitably this this element is intact as the people of God actually physically come together to worship. Now, I just want to look at, I only have time to look at one passage, but I think it can show you this threefold dynamic I'm talking about. Hosea 11.1. It's interesting, remember Dorothy Day at the beginning, she talked about Hosea and the importance of the church. Listen to Hosea 11.1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. That's Hosea. That's not in the New Testament. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son. The prophet, as you know, goes on to warn that even as God called, the people were tempted to unfaithfulness and idolatry. But Hosea pointed to God's faithfulness toward his people. Israel, which you may know, was known as God's firstborn son. See Exodus 4. Israel was God's firstborn son, corporate Israel. God was the one who, it's so beautiful the way Hosea describes it. God's the one who lifted them up, lifted Israel up by their arms and taught them to walk. Even healing them when they didn't know it. Leading them, as Hosea says, this is his words, with cords of kindness With the bands of love, I, the Lord, became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. I bent down to them and fed them. Yahweh is calling to Israel, his people, as his corporate son. Calling them corporately to respond in worship and love, which is manifest in obedience and healthy dependence on God. Yet, as Hosea and you know, in the rest of the Hebrew Scriptures make clear, Israel's response in faith and worship is inconsistent at best (laughs) and completely absent at worst. But you probably anticipated that. this. Matthew 2.15. Because, I don't mean to speak out of turn, but my guess is you read Matthew more often than Hosea. So when you heard that text, you knew it was in the Bible but you probably knew it from Matthew. Matthew 2.15 takes that text from Hosea, but he applies it directly to Christ. Matthew believes the earlier promise to corporate Israel was somehow embodied and fulfilled with the coming of the incarnate son, the Messiah. You need to know this kind of thing. This is why you're, you're, you're taking hermeneutics right, with Andrew, because sometimes people say, oh my gosh, the New Testament, they, they, when you actually look them up, quoting things from the Old Testament, it's all crazy. Well, what you think is crazy if you study it is always amazing. It's never crazy. It's never arbitrary. But anyway, 
Whereas God's people were called out of Egypt and all, repre- <clears throat> and all it represented, they kept turning back in idolatry and disobedience. But Christ is the faithful Son who, filled with the Spirit beyond measure, lives in constant communion with the Father, embodies perfect love and obedience, so that when he is called out as the Son, called out of Egypt, Jesus is not simply acting as an individual, but as the representative of Israel of the people of God, who will bring an eternal deliverance. Jesus embodies Israel and now comes out of Egypt on their behalf, on our behalf. As God's people continue to be called out of Egypt, their rescue is uniquely and necessarily linked to the person and work of Christ. But this calling is not merely a generic call. It moves to the specific, to the personal to you and me. As you know, the shepherd doesn't just call in a generic way. He calls us by name. Lydia, Pete, Andrew, Joan. Called out of slavery to sin, death, and the devil, I am enlivened by the fellowship of the Spirit who secures me in grace, the grace of Christ. I enter into this communion of the saints, all while being able more and more to rest in the love of God. Let me conclude. When we're called to worship, this threefold dynamic of the corporate, the Christological, and the personal, I think moves throughout it. I've just been able to hint, but not develop that. Called out of Egypt, the incarnate Son of God embodied, represented Israel and the church, the one who went through the waters of judgment so that we might sing the songs of deliverance. God calls his people, all of them, but this call moves all the way to the individual. So on Sunday, when you receive the call to worship, may this call lift our gaze to the one who came to love and honor the Father when we would not, offering himself as the one who leads the worship and invites us to enter in. As his people, we might come together as one family called from every tribe, tongue, called by the name, by, by name to be one in Christ. God is calling his people out of the world to himself, calling women and men to be his son, to receive the fullness of his inheritance, which ultimately is to receive nothing less than God himself. That is the great gift. While we were unfaithful in responding, the incarnate son came and responded on our behalf, faithfully replacing our idolatry, rebellion, and hard-heartedness with his faithful worship. And so we enter into the movement of worship and love. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this week. And we pray that you would provoke us to worship. Not because you need it, but because you're worthy. And to not worship you misshapes us. It hurts us. It hurts how we relate to you and to other people and even to your earth. Would you help both those who hear and him who speaks to see your beauty again? To be captured by the wonder of your grace, love, and fellowship. To be confident not in ourselves, but confident in you. And that though we as your people often fail, even at the institutional level, you will not let the gates of hell prevail. We are your body. We are your bride. Help us to believe you genuinely love us. That you even sing over us. Somehow delight in us. Give us the courage and the grace to believe these things. In the name of the risen King, we pray. Amen. Will you join me with thanking?
We're going to take um, uh, the questions in just a moment. Uh, there are quite a number. But I still think it's worth us taking a moment uh, with the person beside us to just think about the things that uh, we've heard this morning and perhaps to share one thing that was most challenging and one thing that was most encouraging in what we've heard this morning. So I'll give you a minute or two to do that and that will give Kelly a chance to catch his breath and then we'll answer questions. All right. I hope that's the beginning of wonderful conversations over morning tea. Uh, but we have a number of questions. We have far too many questions to answer. So we'll just try and group some questions together, if I may. Um, there's a series of questions which I think are born out of our experience of the pandemic and uh, of online church and those sorts of things. Questions like, is online church church? What's your view of long periods of suspended gathering in the life of the church? And have we done enough to uphold the gathered church as an essential service? Those sorts of questions. I'm sure there's no political tension in any of those questions at all. Um, I mean, it's interesting because I don't know kind of the debates here on those things. If I, were, if I was in America answering that question, it's so loaded, I might even answer it a little different. But here, I'm just going to say what I think. <laughs> No one will watch this online later, right? So uh, I think we, it's good and right to praise God for technological advances that have allowed us during a pandemic to be able to, in some kind of strange way, gather. And I think that is a provision that we can and should praise him for. Um, having said that, it's kind of like earlier when I was mentioning the believer in Iran who has to, in their bedroom by themselves, listen to a worship service in a different land, that's a provision, but that is not the ideal. That is not what we should be aiming for. And so I really do think our physical gathered presence matters in ways it's very hard for us to understand. It's interesting, just as an aside, this last book I did called You're Only Human, Part of the research that I hadn't anticipated, I ended up looking into this, you know, the expression in the Bible, you know, greet one another with a holy kiss. And whenever we read it in church, we're like, ha, 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 ha. You know, it's just kind of funny. But when you actually start to look in the ancient church, this was like a really big deal. And, and Tertullian and others, like, if, if I can't, um, if prayers were offered or, or something like that, and it didn't have, it didn't end up with the kiss of one another, the question was, were the prayers even received? And, and part of what was so radical that it represented, and sometimes we think, wow, we live in such a sexualized age. If you know anything about the first century and the tutorial system, and I mean, everything was happening back then. And if we think abuse and misuse of women and children is a problem today, which it can be, all of that's in the ancient church. And so part of what was important about physically gathering together was what a radical, safe place that was, right? Rodney Stark has this book called The Rise of Christianity, and he was a sociologist. He's since become a Christian, but he was just interested. How did the phenomena of Christianity move from this little tiny group? Actually, it's just interesting, historically, a little tiny group to becoming a world religion. And it's, a fast, it's a worth reading. He does talk about plagues and some of those things where Christians would help when others wouldn't because we had a horizon of glory, not just this world. But one of the things he talks about also, the data is, the marginalized women, children, were gathering together because this was a place their bodies were honored because they were treated as family and not in these other ways. So that's just one example of all that to say. I actually think... For the Lord's Supper, for other things, I think definitely we want to lean into corporate gathering. And I do think there are times of extremes when that can't happen. But as much as able, respecting government and all of that, definitely there, I think there needs to be this priority given to the corporate nature of the church. And since we already don't trust institutions, maybe you're seeing it here too, there's people who just aren't going to come back to church now. And, and part of the argument I'm trying to make in the book is it's actually then it's going to malform them. 
They are going, even if they're listening, it, it can hurt them. And I'm not trying to be unsympathetic. Sometimes there are health reasons. I get that. That's fine. But it's just not ideal for any of us. Yeah. There's a second series of questions around the distinction between the visible and invisible church, the heavenly church, if you like, and the things uh, that are predicated of both of those in, yeah. in, in the scriptures. So what would you make of that? Yeah, the, the distinction between the visible and invisible church, I think, is very helpful in many ways. You know, it's an Augustinian distinction. You can argue it's an Apostle Paul distinction kind of thing. Um, but I have seen that go sideways in some of our theology at times, because if you too strongly emphasize the invisible church, you belittle the local church. And so that's my only hesitation there. And, and in fact, my mentor, Colin Gunton, when he was live, I remember he did go through a period, and so this has partly influenced me, where he just started to question the visible and visible distinction. Not because he didn't think that there were Christians, that the, the, the local physical church, but he's just like, in a post-Christian environment in much of the world, or in a non-anti-Christian environment, the benefits of being part of the church are pretty minimal at best, and maybe there's negatives in it. So he was just trying to, to increase the significance of the gathered people of God. And I do think that's right. I, I think we need to have space. Theologically, it just seems to be true um, that the invisible church is bigger and broader and, and heaven and earth. Um, but at the same time, biblically, I do think there is a very strong emphasis just on the local gathered people. Now, at the same time, Paul makes a big deal about this offering and the gathering of these resources to send, right, the Macedonian church and all of that, which tells you the local church is still part of this larger international community, and it's, this is all of God's family. But so I, I want to have space for the universal. I think that's quite important to me for various reasons. But I, we're probably at a space right now, I think, maybe I could be wrong, you could push back on this, where we, I think we probably need to emphasize the local in particular. It would be good to tease that out more and think about the heavenly gathering around Christ mm. and those sorts of things, but uh, I see. there are a se whole series of questions I want to try and get us to. Uh, there, are, there are a number of questions about uh, Matthew 25 and your use of Matthew 25 and um, whether, it, whether the acts done by other brothers and sisters are imputed to us, yeah. or as it says at the top question at the moment, how do we guard against the argument about the whole body of Christ obeying Matthew 25 becoming an excuse for me just doing the bits I want to? That's great. Great, honest question. How many of you have fulfilled Matthew 25? I mean, just read it. Read it for your devotions tonight. My guess is, not happened. So, what happens because we don't, is we don't know what to do. So, so does that mean that all of us in this room, or at least the vast majority of us, are goats? Now, I do think, more theologically than exegetically, we then, in light of that clear observation that most of us in our lives have not done all of the things that seem to describe sheep, we then say, but Jesus did them all, and so we're, we're safe in Jesus, which is true, praise be to God. But the problem with that becomes, in my experience, therefore, and again, I'm talking of an American context of a conservative church, therefore, actually, prisoners don't really matter. And caring for the material of poor, that's just the social gospel. I say, what? Well, it may be social, but it's part of the gospel. <laughs> it, it matters to Jesus. It's part of receiving this good news and living it out. So, having said that, with the question, how do we avoid kind of do our our, our good acts, you know, imputed to one another? No, no, no. I don't. I don't actually believe that. Um, I I don't. I don't have kind of this ancient idea of the merits of saints being transferred. I, I, I don't hold to that. Having said that, I think there is something to the mystical body of Christ 
And it's not, again, it, we would have to take more time. What do we actually think the Christian life is about? When I'm using this example, it's not because I'm actually, I know it sounded this way. I'm not actually like God is up there with this checklist saying, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? I think it's actually, going back to the beginning lectures, this is who God is, and this is what shalom is meant to look like. So in a broken, hurting world where you have prisoners, and if you know anything about first century prisoners and what that's like, like you're not, it's not in our prisons where someone's bringing you a meal and you get to shut. Like you will starve unless someone comes and gives you food, right? So all that to say, um, I lost my thought. It's jet lag, I'm sure. But, <laughs> oh, I, I just think, I think that, it's not about people giving us their right, but I think we, we have made faith too individualistic. And if you want to know what I think about this, there's a chapter in the book called Embodied Hope, and the chapter's called Faith, Hope, and Love. And it, let me change it for you, because I know this sounds very, very problematic. But in that book, when I'm wrestling through suffering and pain, some of you may experience this. Well, one of my mentors, who's a friend who's a retired theologian, he used to say to me, Kelly, I wake up every morning as an atheist. And by about nine in the morning, I'm a monotheist. And by about noon, I'm a Christian. Gosh, I thought you'd laugh harder at that. I thought that's, <laughs> that, that's hilarious. But what his point is, he, this is a person who is, he's a theologian, his entire life struggled with depression. And, and many of you know this, like, do you every minute of the day always believe? Like, what happens if you're walking out of, the, out of this meeting today and you trip and you hit your head and you don't remember everything? Are you losing your salvation? What happens when you're going through a crisis? This is going to happen in your churches. Someone is coming to church and the truth is, they're pretty sure God isn't good. They're not even sure God exists anymore. So did they just lose their salvation? And I would just tell you, I think biblically and experientially, faith is a corporate sport. I, I'm not under my, I need to believe as an individual, but I'm just telling you, if you really start to examine what faith is, it's just a lot more complex than we tend to experience or tend to recognize, especially if you think of it in terms of trust and all of these kind of things. So part of what happens is we take the brother or sister in crisis and we come to them in their doubts and we say, it's okay. God's not panicking. Just keep with us. You can't sing, but we will sing for you. You can't pray, but we will pray for you. And eventually you find that belief starts to manifest again. So that may sound very scary and wrong to you. My experience is faith is just a lot more complicated than we recognize, especially if you don't think of it as merely cognitive. And until you make some kind of more corporate move in light of Christ, then you're, you start to think you're the one generating the faith rather than receiving it as a gift from God through his people. Another series of questions seeks to reconcile um, the sinful, fallen, fractured nature of the church and the call to holiness and purity. So uh, one form of the question, um, though the church is a whore at times, yet she is our mother, that quote. Um, how does that reconcile with the new covenant purity we see in, say, Ezekiel 36 or Ephesians 5? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is a great question. Um, and this is part of what Mark and others are trying to navigate as, as leaders in a church and in a denomination. Um, the reality is that there is no... The, it, the, the holiness of the church, the unity of the church, is, is, is a belief. Because the church is fractured. And, the, and, and you might think, well take a particular political buzzword issue and like, look at the church, how unfaithful it is. But just so you know, there's no option of a church that is perfectly pure in her practices, right? 
Where I'm in America, we have certain issues that we're rightly deeply concerned about in the church, but you almost never hear any of the churches that I'm involved with say, oh my gosh, look around, we are totally materialistic. We have a massive problem with consumerism. I'm telling you, that sin is way more prevalent in my circles than most of the sexual sins. But we're like, eh, it's not a biggie. So all, I, all I'm saying is we, we need to not be comfortable when the church is neglecting clearly prohibited biblical things or, or the unholiness of the church. I, we need to, I'm not saying just be wishy-washy, but I am just saying don't let the ideal... Don't let the ideal be the enemy of the good. Because otherwise, well, and especially if you're young in ministry, you may still have the ideal. You will get crushed. Sorry. You have to have a more nuanced view of the church because it's so exciting at first. And then you realize, oh, these are all sinners. And then you realize if you're mature, oh, I'm much more problematic than I even realized. So all that is to say, I think we don't need to neglect the problems in the church, but I also want us to constantly admit there is no ideal. It's just not here except in the heavens. That is where the church is pure and perfect. So, yeah, something like that. Great. A series of questions are asked about liturgy and the tension between liturgy that engages and is uh, reflective of our current context and uh, between liturgies that are countercultural mm. and theologically shaped. Uh, let me put two questions together, yes. if I may. Um, our churches often imitate worldly liturgy, cafes, concerts, TED Talks. <laughs> uh, how do we practise counterformative liturgies of worship and still get people in the door? And the second one... Um, uh, was uh, just skipped down the line, didn't it? Um, was more about um, how do we have forms of liturgy that reach people who are more than just middle class? Yeah. Are our liturgies too middle class and too shaped to educated, highly educated people? I love those questions. And in some ways, I'm just going to be waiting for, me, for emails from some of you in the future to help me figure it out. Because I do think, uh, you know, some of you know uh, James K.A. Smith, Jamie Smith, um, he, he's written some similar things to me on this. And there, there are just all kinds of liturgies, right? The shopping mall is a liturgy. Amazon takes us through a liturgy. And so I love that kind of question because I do think we're, we are kind of shaped in liturgical ways without recognizing it. And part of what the church needs to do, part of what's tempting for the church is basically to adopt those liturgies and baptize them and kind of make church consumeristic and some of those things. And it is interesting, like I've seen, you know, churches give TED Talks and you're like, you can anticipate exactly how it goes, you know. I mean, they don't call it TED Talks, but um, so I, I do think there's something more and more powerful to young people in particular, to be honest that's countercultural, because they have very strong meters to say, like, this is not real, it's not authentic, right? And so something to be courageous about and different, but not countercultural just to be angry or something, but this idea of sacredness. And, but one thing I'm, I'm cautious about is I don't want to imagine that, say, countercultural means you need to have incense or something. That's not what I'm talking about it, but I do think it's countercultural to take time in a worship service to be quiet. It's countercultural to sing. It's countercultural to sing songs that are from different ages and from places around the world and not just your own particular, you know, white male kind of thing. So I do think these things are genuine challenges. Um, and I'm just convinced we all have liturgies and our churches have liturgies. So at, at its base, I want us to be more aware of them. And then, in light of your kind of right questions, go, how do we not just get co-opted by culture and yet uh, 
try and speak in a way that they can understand in our particular cultures? And I don't have a short answer for that. It's a great question. Let's thank Kelly. Well, I'm sure you'll agree that um, over the last week, Kelly's provided us with a richly stimulating and deeply edifying series of lectures on the theology of the Christian life. Kelly's long experience as a teacher has been obvious, as has been his extensive knowledge of what he's called a number of times the theological tradition. His reflections on this important topic have roamed over the length and breadth of that tradition. We've heard from Augustine and Owen, Luther, yeah, yeah, and um, <laughs> Calvin, <laughs> as we might have expected, but also Prosper of Aquitaine and Julian of Norwich and Peter Lombard and even Joseph Jungmann uh, and a host of modern authors. But above all, what's been obvious, dear brother, is your own deep personal faith in our common Lord and your joy in our common salvation. Your lectures have been clear and incisive. You've both encouraged us and warned us. You've shown us again and again uh, the very important connection between Christian theology and Christian living. You've encouraged us to avoid harmful uh, yet familiar dichotomies and you've modelled that, what that looks like in your own teaching over the week. The triune frame of your lectures that I mentioned at the beginning has been immensely helpful and I'm certain that many of us will be looking over our notes in the days and weeks ahead, listening to the recordings of the lectures to remind ourselves of important things that you've said and the way that you've said them and eagerly waiting the emergence of the book. There are a number of reasons why this series, uh, this lecture series, the annual Moore College Lectures, is such a valuable part of our college program. It gives us an opportunity to engage with first-rate biblical and theological scholarship from leading voices around the world and from our own faculty as well and we are able to share this opportunity with others as guests join us in person and listen to us on the live stream. But they also provide us with an opportunity for Christian fellowship and a powerfully significant reminder that we are not alone and that we are part of a family of Christian believers that stretches through time and across the world. Hearing different voices rejoicing in the same Lord and the same gospel that we do sharing experiences of God's grace, even of God's grace in the midst of difficulty and pain, as well as joy and triumph, is a wonderful gift of God for which we are immensely grateful and we have enjoyed and relished that over this week. So thank you for that. We're so grateful that you were willing to take the long journey uh, to Australia. We're especially grateful to Tabitha for encouraging you to come and for manning the fort at home while you travelled halfway across the world. Uh, those of us who met her uh, in your last visit know what a wonderful encouragement she is to you and how special your life together is. And we are grateful for your fellowship, your graciousness and the many kind and helpful things you've said to many of us in one-to-one -one conversations as well as through these lectures. So thank you for making this last week and a half so memorable. We want to give you some small gifts to take with you as a reminder of your time with us here in Australia and at Moore College. <laughs> Don't come up there. <laughs> Sadly, when I went to the store and asked for Legos, they had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> uh, but we sent somebody with some understanding of American culture who might be able to translate and so Pete all went and he ended up with these. <laughs> uh, and I do recognise that Lego um, has uh, a 90th birthday celebration coming up this year, so there you go. <laughs> Seriously, though, we want to thank you uh, and look forward to the next time we're able to share fellowship with you, the fellowship of the Father and the Son into which we're drawn by the powerful work of the Spirit. So, dear brother, come and thank you very much. <laughs>
Before I close in prayer uh, and we go out to morning tea, I've got two brief announcements to make. Simply that if you're a student here at college, the regular lectures begin again at 11.15. Please see if you can get to the lecture room by 11.10 uh, so that you can uh, be ready to start at 11.15. And uh, secondly, next year's annual lectures are going to be delivered by Professor Desmond Alexander of Union Theological College in Belfast. You might know him from his many books, including Parada From Paradise to, the, to Promised Land. Uh, Professor Alexander will be speaking on Beginning with Moses, the New Testament use of the Pentateuch with reference to Jesus Christ. And they promise to be another brilliant set of annual lectures. So look out for the dates on the college website soon. Why don't we pray together and then go and enjoy morning tea. Our Father, we do thank you for the fellowship that we enjoy with your people from many places, from many different backgrounds. We thank you, Father, for ways in which we've been stretched over this last week and a half. We thank you, Father, for Kelly, the gifts you've given him, and for his willingness to come. Uh, we thank you for Tabitha, his wife, and we thank you for the way in which she has encouraged him. We pray that you might continue uh, to strengthen and sustain her. And we pray, Heavenly Father, as we continue to think about these things, that you might enable us to test all things by your word. And those things which are from you, let us hold on to tightly. And those things which aren't, let them fall to the ground. So that in the end, Father, in all that we do and say, we might honour your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.